Hi there, and welcome to Real Talk in ELT, a podcast about the reality of teaching English. I'm your host, Kelly Pennington. Thank you for joining me today. So welcome back, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, who is Artur Franco. Franco, is that? Yes. Uh, I is usually like say Franco. Franco? <laughs> Yeah, I don't do the R. I can't roll the R. So, Franco. Okay. Yeah. So, Artur was born and raised in Duque de Caxias. Is that right? Caxias. Caxias. Okay, yeah. sorry. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not Carioca. So, it's on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro. He holds a bachelor's degree in Portuguese and English from Universidade Federal de Rio de Janeiro. Yes. Oh my God, my Portuguese is getting good. And a CELTA certificate from the University of Cambridge. He is now based in Copacabana, which is the super famous area, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and he teaches um, at an English institution and also online to people all around Brazil. And his specific areas of interest are creativity and critical thinking. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. And today, uh, the reason that I message Artur and I wanted to have him on is because he's passionate about and I felt like he was going to be the perfect person to talk about diversity in the classroom and how to talk about difficult <clears throat> or controversial topics with your students. The reason being, I have to tell a quick story about Artur. Uh, I was taking a course with him and he I was observing his lesson and he had this amazing lesson um, and it was talking about equality, especially with um, black women and working in the workplace, right? It was, that was the topic of exactly. it. Exactly. And I just remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I don't think I would feel comfortable talking about that. Not because it's not an important issue, but it's, you never know what happens in a classroom. You never know how people react to things and you never know how people are going to, the conversations that come up because it is a charged subject. You know, people are going to have strong reactions when we start talking about uncomfortable things. Um, you know, social problems that are really important, but it's, for me, it would be uncomfortable. So I thought, you know what? Let's have our tour on and he's gonna chat, <laughs> chat with us about it. <laughs> Uh, so to start us off, could you please just give us a little bit of background, how you got into teaching? Just tell us about yourself. Sure. Well, I started teaching nine years ago, approximately. And uh, one of the things that led me there was the fact that I hadn't passed the, the course I wanted at that time. I really wanted to study uh, media and communication, things like that. But then I started university and uh, I really liked what was what people were teaching there, you know, like people really concerned about social issues, things that I myself uh, wasn't really sure about. And uh, I do have to tell you that <laughs> for me, who, who I, I am a black person, I'm a, I'm a black man, but I, I took a long time to figure that out, you know, because of my upbringing, I really thought uh, I, I really saw myself as a non-black person because of the tone of my color, things like that, that reduced the way I saw myself in, uh, in society. And uh, for that reason, when I started university, I started seeing myself uh, differently because of the social issues that the university offered me. And I think this was very clear uh, because it was a public university, I'm not so sure about the, the approach, the social approach in uh, private universities, but I felt really confident and comfortable to be myself there. And this is what I really wanted to bring to my classes as a teacher as well. So it, it was how everything started, you know? Well, that makes sense. I mean, you go, you have this experience. It's obviously a profound experience for you. You feel more comfortable with yourself as a person with your identity and and then of course it kind of translates into well this is something that brought great value to me so this is something that i want to bring great value to my students as well yeah. not only because you know we're teachers of english which is important because obviously it's the, a global language and we want our students to do well and have job opportunities but at the same time uh we're teaching people 
and people are complicated. We're complex, you know? So these issues do come up. It's not a sterile environment. These are things that happen every day. And so it's something that while we're teaching a language, we're also talking about things that are happening, not just the news, you know, social issues as well. Exactly. Uh, and the building on that, I guess, many Black people or LGBT people, people from minorities in general, they tend to lack confidence whenever speaking a foreign language, especially in English, because this is a, a language of dominance nowadays. So we are dealing with power. And those groups of minorities, they usually do not deal with power in their daily routine, etc. So they don't really feel uh, that confident with the language. I could, I could tell, I could notice that. So maybe bringing things that they would be comfortable with maybe would be a, a way of teaching English, you know, because then they would feel that they are in that place of uh, uh, expressing themselves and also sharing what they already know with others, which sometimes we, we don't think we do have many things to share since we are part of groups that are usually not heard by others, you know? So I think mixing the the teaching of English, which is a, a, a dominant language, to people from minorities, I think it's just a great combo. <laughs> I think people can't yeah. really, you know, people only can profit from that. So then that kind of leads me into another question. Uh, would you mind kind of talking about some of the challenges that you've had or some of the things that you felt um, at possibly as a, an English student or as an English teacher and how that kind of translates into this is something we need to talk about in the classroom so that people feel more comfortable or that these challenges aren't as daunting for the next, you know, the next generation of people that flow through uh, the education system and specifically the the English uh, English courses. Sure, sure. I guess uh, course books in general, they do not tackle uh taboo issues or like I really don't like this word but they usually don't talk don't tackle social issues that much and when I was this well, it's student, hard for them too because like if we, sorry to interrupt you but no it's it's difficult for course book people to create course books because usually the course books are international mm -hmm. and so they have to stay on very very neutral topics like sports and traveling <laughs> and things like that, that that we always see because they never know where these course books are going they need to have a very wide uh appeal to every you know english course and so you it's not the fault of the course books but it's it's limiting mm -hmm. obviously exactly I, i i guess this is the point you know uh i i I'm not a, an enemy of course books, definitely not. But especially back then, when I was a student of English, those topics would be much, much more limiting, limited. You know, they, they would be much uh, narrower. And uh, as a student, I think I wasn't really represented by that. That, that whole and sometimes in in discussions about serious things of course I, i i would have my points of view there and i would express myself but at the same time i think we could talk about other things that were related to the topic related to the discussion but there were more important to me you know that would deal with things that uh things that concern my identity, you know, things that are really precious to me. But no, they were really abroad, you know? So this is what I really didn't like about that. And uh, I think it's the teacher's role to understand those uh, issues that are going on in the class book and even in the group itself and try to mediate the topic in a way that integrates everybody and that everybody feels in their element to talk about things they are into and uh, feel safe, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, but we do this anyway, don't we? I mean, in a, mm, in a limited way, most teachers do do that. Like if we see that we have a bunch of people in our, our class and if we're teaching a general English course and there's a, a unit on sports, And 90% of the classes, yeah, I don't, I don't like sports. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, usually we just kind of, we, we kind of like speed through that unit as fast as possible because nobody's really interested. And, and I think that's kind of the wrong way to go. Like, okay, so you guys aren't interested in sports. Not a problem. Let me take what you need to learn, like either vocabulary or grammar or, you know, discourse or whatever issues, pronunciation that they're trying to teach you here. And let's adapt the materials so that people are actually engaged in it. Exactly. So that's like one of the problems is that students don't engage with materials that just really aren't relevant to them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes so. materials get outdated. So you really need to do something. To oh my God, outdated frequently. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I, I, I guess as a student, I, I wouldn't feel that represented by all of the topics that were presented. And as a teacher, I would feel sometimes that people expected more from me. So maybe a better uh, pronunciation or maybe, uh, I don't know, a better engagement uh, within the classroom. I really don't know, but I really felt that, that extra pressure going on since I'm a black person, LGBT. So you, you felt that you had like a, a higher standard. It wasn't explicit. Nobody ever said anything to you, but it was just kind of how you felt that you were being held to a higher standard. Exactly. Oh, that's, yeah, that's actually really disappointing. I think that uh, it's so unfortunate. And well, I guess this is quite structural for us to, to change, but as teachers, I guess this is one of the things that we could try to do with our students. So uh, especially here in Copacabana, I, I teach mainly white people you know, and the white people who only have white friends, you know. So, of course, the, the notion of, of white, whiteness here in Brazil is a bit different from the United States, but even so. I know, because I'm, I'm you know, almost transparent. I'm so white. Well, I'll stay inside, too, because of the pandemic of bringing it all back. This is why that I always feel I have a difficult time approaching these issues, because I feel that I've always been very welcoming to everyone mm -hmm. i really don't care your color your creed your background i'm not i'm not interested i'm like are you a good person or do you want to learn english like let's go so what would you say for people how to talk about it in an appropriate way with students that might be interested in talking about it sure i guess it comes from the from this understanding i guess this understanding that we teachers sometimes don't know exactly everything about something about a specific subject and that's okay uh whenever we uh, come up with a topic and uh, we want to develop it into classroom we always we always uh research uh everything about it beforehand of course but i guess uh in, in dealing with social issues we do have to do the same and uh, not only going through books or articles but also talking to people of that specific minority group you would like to portray or would like to discuss about i guess this is where we the way to go you know like understanding that we are not there in order to uh explain everything that is going on or teach students everything that is going on but rather to mediate and uh really get students to think about the topic uh sometimes they haven't thought about that before as you as you mentioned here oh i didn't think brazilians would be that racist because of the skin colors etc but yes we are and uh, the people who know best are the people who suffer from that not only not the people who, who generate it they they also they they can generate racism or even other phobias uh just by a specific the word sometimes or a specific way they look at us that sometimes they do not think they are being that rude or that racist or that etc but they are you know and uh talking about subtleties talking about ways of communication uh talking about specific language is what comes uh with our area you know because this this is when language comes and uh that we can really delve into those 
those matters with our students and uh, really make them think, uh, make they rethink what they are talking to others in order to create a more mindful communication. I think this is the this is our role, not exactly to teach what to do, what not to do. Right, because I don't even know how I would teach us. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, you know? Just, you know, like we, we, we can't really, we, we're not experts in everything. Oh. But I think that's like a super good point is that we have to think that we're mediators of communication. Like how can we better allow people to communicate with each other? And there are subtleties, especially in language. Um, as a, a completely non-related example, a lot of my students will send messages or emails at work. And I'm like, oh, that sounds really rude. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah, that's very, very direct. It sounds very rude. This is going to be misinterpreted. And so, and, and they hadn't even realized it because in their L1, they they can say things that are very direct and it doesn't sound very rude or aggressive. Uh, but then as soon as they transition to an L2, it's like, no, 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 like you can't say it like that. It's not exactly that way. You have to kind of sprinkle a little politeness on there just so you're not misinterpreted. And so that's the idea of, of teaching these kind of controversial topics. Exactly. Bringing the, the communicative part to it. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Like how to approach these with respect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's hard for people. I think that most people avoid it because it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. so. I, I think uh, that sometimes it's uncomfortable. It, it, it's a bit more uncomfortable for the teacher themselves than for the students you well, know because we don't know what's gonna happen like we're like all right i got this great lesson it's a little controversial who knows what's not controversial but like who knows when when i say controversial i mean i'm not talking like lifestyles are controversial no i'm saying i never know how polarized <laughs> my students are going to be on this topic yeah. what their opinion is like that's why it's controversial like it's it's hard to bring up in a class because we never know what the result is going to be mm -hmm. I, I think this is a risk this is a risk we take by bringing these issues i i guess nobody is ever free from that so uh from my point of view i guess only only having the intention to do so is amazing and, and only trying to do so in specific maybe in specific exercises or in specific texts you know like uh criticizing the the text itself or a specific image like it can be something very punctual it can be something very specific it's not necessary to be the whole class but you are doing a great job already you know i, I think this is my point maybe uh diversity in the classroom shouldn't be seen as something big and wow that's huge that's amazing i think it should be seen as something really uh embedded in our in our classes you know like here and there we can discuss something like uh, about black people and about lgbt people maybe as as not to to be threatening for anyone in that sense because sometimes we have really polarizing uh, students there but just in order to to touch here and to you know little by little uh, expand our learners uh, understanding of diversity i guess this is really really rich yeah i uh responding to that i had a student uh one time tell me uh, he's a business student. I had been teaching him for uh, a short period of time. I, I didn't really know him. And he needed help with um, kind of like promotion type of stuff. He was trying to work his way up in the company. And I said, okay, yeah, well, that, I worked in that area previous to teaching. Like, let me, let me help you with this. And uh, so we, you know, redid his resume. We were working on interview skills. We were doing his LinkedIn profile, you know, all of the stuff related to like, how can you better position yourself in the market? And uh, it, a lot of it was just having conversations with him and trying to change his, I hate this word because it's become like a keyword, but like his mind mindset or his perspective, change his perspective on how to uh, present yourself as the person that's right for the position. And he told me, he goes, wow, he said some, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he said something like, wow, I didn't expect you 
to be as knowledgeable or wow, you actually know what you're doing. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're just a, you're just a teacher. But I knew the undertone of it. It's because I was a woman. Exactly. That, and he, do, he didn't see me as an authority in that position because he had made other kind of sexist type of comments. And so I was kind of taken aback by that. But then I was like, but then he became, which was really interesting, he became one of my biggest advocates in terms of recommending other students mm-hmm. and his wife and his brother and like a bunch of his friends and everybody. So then it, it was just constant recommendations because I, I guess I proved him wrong mm-hmm. or I proved his initial thinking wrong. Mm-hmm. And that was it. That the, After that, I don't think he ever questioned anything that I say. <laughs> well, I mean, you should question some of the things <laughs> I say are ridiculous. But, <laughs> but he never really questioned me afterwards because I had proved myself, uh, which I don't think is necessary to do. Uh, if you're a professional, you should just be taken at face value as a professional. But um, but yeah, it was it was an interesting that that was the only thing, only real experience that I had had uh, recently as a teacher that I was like, wow, I wonder what your vision of me was before. Mm-hmm. Just because I'm a, a, a woman and a teacher, it, I don't know what he was expecting. Exactly. So. And these are things that we go through almost almost all the time with different people i've been through a similar situation with a student of mine who who happened to see part of my lesson or or just a snippet i'm not so sure uh and he was like no i'm not going to participate on that because he is a gay man yeah something like that but he he didn't explicitly uh said that but it, it was what was going on and uh, the other semester came and he became a student because there was no other times available. And he was my best student because he loved the lessons and everything was amazing. And uh, he still, he talks to me until these days. And it's like six, six years already. So <laughs> I, I think this uh, act of proving people wrong is really common. Uh, to happen with us, unfortunately. And uh, I guess the new generation and also this generation, which is there, uh, I guess they they should know better. I think they should uh, understand that there are other people different from them everywhere. You know, they are everywhere. I mean, this is just so basic, but we, it's so weird to like have to have this conversation. Like you are not the, you know, the standard person, but there is no standard person, you know, like, so it's a weird thing to have to say though. It's, and we're having (laughs) to say there, there is no standard of person. There's no standard of lifestyle. And just because something is different than what you're accustomed to, uh, it doesn't mean that that person is not a professional, that that person is is wrong. Um, so yeah, it's 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 weird for me though that we still have to say these types of things. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and uh, I think like like presenting topics in the classroom that are diverse usually helps uh, when when you are analyzing textbooks or course books in general you are often uh you you often come across white people and these days it's changing but it's changing a lot because back in my days when i was studying only white people would appear like a black person out of nowhere gay people or, or lgbtq relationships we would never see that and nowadays uh there are people talking about for instance uh plural plural nouns we can say fathers what would be fathers oh to to man uh with a child you know like this would be fathers mothers would be something different and parents would be something different so uh, we these are things that we could uh show our students uh only by analyzing language and not exactly tackling uh social issues but at the same time we are doing that you know so i i think those minor things that we do in class often instigate our students to think brother, uh, to, to think in a more brother way. Uh, and I think this is 
really precious. This is really what I like doing in class, you know, to instigate and uh, even to learn from them because this new generation is coming with lots of things and the things that I myself don't know. So they do have to teach me as well. And I think we should be open to hear them, to hear what they have to say, because this is what we usually do whenever we are dealing with with the different people, with people that we deem strange or awkward or, you know, alien. Sometimes we don't really hear those people. We don't really listen to what these people have to say. And problem starts there. So whenever we we are discussing these issues in classroom, we are kind of making students listen to these things, listen to these issues. And I guess, as you mentioned, uh, being uncomfortable talking about it, I guess these discussions are usually, well, at least I try to do this way, they're usually more student-led. You know, like you're just there to mediate, of course, and maybe you maybe you can pinpoint like a couple of students who really understand the topic, you know, in a way that they feel confident, talk about it. And then you spotlight those students because this is their way, their their time to to shine, you know. So I, I guess going through a more student led this a student led discussion might generate interesting this uh, interesting topics uh, for reflection. You know, I like that you said uh, about reflection. I think it's interesting to have students who feel comfortable and who feel confident discussing this because not everybody does. So please don't highlight students that, <laughs> that are obviously uncomfortable. Like we need to read the room. Exactly. Um, but the reflection is actually a, a quite a, a key point for me as well. Um, I again, I don't. I try to bring up a lot of these issues. Unfortunately, I work with a lot of business English people, so I some of the issues and most of the issues are related to the workplace and inequalities in the workplace and how people view. I mean, the social issues are transcendent, whether it's general English or business English, but it just kind of has a, like a different context, you know. Um, but one thing that I've done relatively recently was I. I found a bunch of articles and, and things that uh, people think they know about uh, and kind of just gave them a history, almost like a history lesson, but n not, it wasn't coming from me. It was coming from articles and things like that. And uh, one of my students, he's, he's young, he's finishing up his university. He's just starting in his career. And um, there's a, a book about women in business and the inequalities in the workforce. So uh, I said, pick a part of this book, any part of the book that you're comfortable with. It was really just profiles of women in the workplace and things that they had gone through, like uh, wage difference and how they're treated and, you know, the, in the interactions and the power dynamic that you had mentioned, the power dynamic between, you know, men and women in the office and those types of things. And I said, and just reflect on it and report back to me that was kind of his assignment to to read it to see what was going on and 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 report back he goes i had no idea does this really happen and i said does what really happen uh and he said he said i mean do women really get paid less than men do i was like oh my god absolutely absolutely as a teacher and i told him this because he's my student i'm i'm very very transparent with my student i said as a teacher i have several friends who are male who teach in uh, this city and in, in Brazil in general, who can charge a value per hour and are never questioned. The students never ask for discounts and they charge much more than I do with some of them with fewer qualifications. And when I charge, I'm questioned about it. I charge less than normal. They ask for discounts. People try to change the payment terms and everything else. And I said, why is it that uh, and I, I've given the the comparison of I have a friend and he's Australian and he's a white male and we have very similar qualifications and we have a very similar style. Uh, we've actually worked together. I don't know exactly how much he he charges, but I know that he does charge more per hour for his private classes and he never gets questioned and I do. Mm -hmm. And he's like, 
oh my God, I had no idea. Does this really happen? And it was just out of pure ignorance that he didn't know. And it wasn't out of, because he was trying to be a bad person or anything like that. He just didn't know. Mm -hmm. He didn't know that it actually happened. Mm -hmm. And so it just for him reflecting, he was like, oh, wow. And we had this huge discussion and he was really interested. He's like, I had no idea. This is great. And, you know, so... Maybe it's just out of ignorance that we don't have these discussions. Like we don't think that it's really happening, but it is. Mm -hmm. And so. uh, a, a great, great story, by the way. I this is so representative that sometimes we as teachers are introducing things that for us is such a normal situation. Such a it, it's a granted, you know, like. But for students, it's pretty new. So I, I think it's amazing for, for, for you to have bringing, uh, to have brought this story uh, because sometimes we feel constrained about bringing a topic to the table because this topic might be uh, controversial or you name it. But at the same time, maybe this topic is the background story of a specific student there and it's something super alien for all of the others. And uh, I'm not saying that we should all, always uh, present the social issues or, you know. Uh, so this is not like the basis of your curriculum or your syllabus. Definitely not. But, but I, I, I guess, they, you know, they, they, they should be there somehow. They, they should be there in one class or another. They should be present. And uh, we are not losing anything from, from that. Uh, <laughs> it's quite the contrary, right? We, we, we tend to have our student a bit more in tune with our classes whenever we, we bring to the table things that are special to them and that connects with their reality. So, of course, maybe you were teaching. Right now, I have to, to make this opposition because I started teaching Duque de Caxias, which is a city in the outskirts of Rio, so there are uh, people from a different background. Uh, and here in Copacabana, a different reality. And I know that I'm dealing with different audiences, but why not bringing one to the other, you know, in order to show people different realities, different ways of life, different uh, structures, different realities. I think uh, uh, my students usually laugh a lot when I bring Duque de Caxias issues to, to, the to the class and they are like, oh, I, I couldn't imagine uh, this place was like that because I have never been to this place. I've never, I, I only see what media shows me or what people talks uh what people talk to me about this. Uh, but isn't that important? As we're teaching an English, a global language, and people are going to be using this to talk to other people in business, to talk to other people when they travel, to go in and visit other places and experience new cultures. Isn't it important that we create students that have compassion and awareness that they are not the center of the universe. Yes, exactly. And uh, also uh, uh, for, for, for the students that are read as privileged students, so maybe a white person, like a slave person, etc., etc. For privileged students, socially privileged students, uh, I guess this is a way of exactly that. Oh, Hello, you're not the center of the world. There are other people there. There are other accents there. So, uh, you know, some people are very concerned about, oh, speaking like a, a, an American native speaker, things like that. And please don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> For <laughs> well, all of you out there, please don't, please don't focus on that. Oh, come on. Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, and then exposing these people to different accents, different realities. I think this is also a great way for them to understand, no, uh, there are other people going on in the English world that they are not as privileged or as socially privileged as I thought they were, but they are important as well. They are also necessary. They are also worth it. Uh, so encouraging different podcasts or different uh, songs, you know, from, from people from all around the world in order for them to practice listening for instance, is a great way to go. But on the other, uh, going to the, to the other counterpart, we have students who are not socially privileged and they feel insecure of speaking English because this is a privileged language. So 
for these students, it's also uh, very profitable to show them, oh, no, there are people who do not speak English in that specific pattern that you are accustomed to. There are people who speak English with different patterns, different accents, different ways. So in this way, you are talking to students, oh, you can speak English as well. It's not a problem to you because people are speaking English out there. The whole world is trying to do so. And sometimes they do it in, 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 in different ways. Maybe it's not, whoa, the perfect way. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Because it's just not read as such, you know? It's just read as something marginal, something uh, uh, non-standard. But no standard is okay. Yeah, no I, I think standard. It doesn't point, even you know? exist anymore. Yeah, I mean, we know. It just doesn't, like, standard English. What are you talking about, standard English? It doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, I, I spoke with, a few months ago, I spoke with a group of um, Indian people f uh, from, oh, gosh, I forget the region. It was, like, Eastern India. Uh, and it, it was teachers and uh, more advanced students and I loved talking with them and it, it was great. And they communicate and they go, well, how can we speak more like you? I'm like, why? Yeah. That, and I, I, I literally asked the question, the organizer of the, of the workshop that I was presenting at, he was like, yes, you know, like raising his hand, like, yes, absolutely, Kelly. And because then one of his students, um, she was adorable and she's actually super advanced. She was 12. And she would have this conversation with me. She was asking me questions. I mean, I mean, we were talking about very advanced things and she was during the workshop. And uh, she asked me, she said, well, how do I speak like you? And I said, well, why would you want to speak like me? She goes, oh, because I want to speak better. I was like, okay, well, you can get more vocabulary. You can, you know, work on pronunciation of certain things a little bit more, but are we not having a conversation right now? She goes, yes, but I want to speak just like you. And I was like, but why? Because you, you'll never be me and I'll never be you. So it, the, you know, I think going back way back to the beginning of our conversation, um, being okay with your identity, I think is where it kind of first starts for people who are going into other languages. Like you have to be comfortable with who you are. Like I'm a girl from Boston, and that's who I'll always be. I moved to a different part of the world, but I'm going to be Kelly. I'm loud, I'm brash, I swear too much. Uh, my mother gets embarrassed of me. I'm a very generous person. Do you know what I mean? But this is who I am, and I just accept who I am. That's okay. I'll never speak Portuguese properly. I'll probably never speak any of the second languages if, if, as I continue to learn. I'll never speak any of them perfectly, but it's who I am. And so accepting who you are is like kind of the first step in speaking another another language. Like you just have to know who you are mm -hmm. and it's okay as long as you're understood and you can have conversations and you can communicate in a thoughtful and very understanding, sympathetic way, then what more can we do? Exactly. Also, understanding who you are is easier, maybe, for some people, I guess. As I told you before, I wouldn't see myself as a black person until I was in university. So I wouldn't understand a very important part of my identity and why would I deal with such, uh, so much racism, you know, during my life. And uh, I only realized that later on. I guess many people do not really know who they are because they are often told by others who they are. And these others are usually different from them. So I guess, again, bringing issues of diversity is always, always uh, a win-win. Because then that student who does not, who, who did not identify as, I don't know, a specific, w with a specific trait, then this student will look at that and say, oh, I have been through that. I can identify with that. And then build on their own identity because of that. I, I guess not only we help people who do not under understand the otherness, but we also help people that are in the otherness realm to un understand themselves, you know, and, and feel a bit more comfortable. I guess this is the way to go. Uh, uh, I, I really appreciate you bringing that, like be content with yourself, like embrace yourself. And I don't, yeah, I don't mean to say it like, 
flippantly like, oh, just know who you are. That's a process. I mean, I've actually become better acquainted with who I am exactly because I've moved to a different country because, and I've had to question things where, and it was discussions like this, maybe not in the classroom, but discussions with like my husband, like, why does this happen here? Like, what is this? What is this cultural thing, this abnormality? For me, I consider an abnormality. Like, why is this happening here? Because, and it's abnormal for me. And he goes, well, why do you think it should? Well, I said, because the way that I grew up, it was this way, this way, this way. Yeah. And he goes, ah, well, here it's not that way. It's this way, this way, this way. I'm like, oh, uh. <laughs> but that, you know, and I, I do, I understand that I probably came from a position of social privilege and that's, a, I mean, it's okay. It's, I didn't ask for it. It just happened, you know, <laughs> but having those conversations with my husband, moving around, talking to other people and just asking like, oh, well, where, where do you come from? And how was it when you grew up, you know, in the, the countryside of Brazil? And what was that like? And what did that, and it, it makes you start to think of, I've grown as a person just being exposed to these conversations. Like, oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's, that's very different. And it makes me question whether there obviously there is no right way but it's kind of like huh was that better for me or should it i think i probably would have been like a more content person if i did it that you start to really reflect on how it is so the conversation just the conversation can really help people exactly yes mm-hmm. this is so precious right i i love it i i gotta know i got i gotta say that uh whenever we 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 had conversations during delta and uh, not only after that class that I that I brought, but also before, I I, al- I always felt very comfortable talking to you. Not only with you, of course, but all of the other classmates as well. I felt comfortable with. But I I, I guess the the thing that linked us a, a lot was our vulnerabilities. And I think this is amazing to bring to the class because we are not only teachers that we are not. Uh, we are not only teachers there, we are not only professionals there, we are also people there showing our faces, being vulnerable to others because we are clearly outnumbered whenever we are in class. And uh, we are being vulnerable uh, every time. So why not bring right. vulnerability to discussion? Uh, why not uh, sharing these, uh, also the background that we have with, with our students? And whenever we do not feel comfortable sharing otherness, uh, things that we ourselves are not very familiar with. This is the way to go, like having a conversation with people who are familiar with that and and then having some insights into what to bring to students, into what to to, uh, propose as possible reflections. I guess uh, this is exactly what what you said before. I guess we are indeed mediators and uh, we should... I, I don't know. I, 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 my eyes sparkle <laughs> when I'm talking about that, when I see teachers, not only as, not only, no, not as people who are the givers of something, but rather people who are there to instigate and uh, really create. Like participate other... in the process. Yes, like, exactly. We're part of it, too. Yeah. I think it's so beautiful. We are there for that reason. We are that you know, to, to make better human beings, maybe, or, or more open-minded people, because this is what language is about, open-mindedness. So, you know, at the end of the day... Communication, we... sharing culture, sharing history. Yeah. I mean, when people say, like, I need to learn English, we think of it as such a sterile thing, and it's really not, because what are you going to use English for? You're going to travel, you're going to work, you're going to experience things. And so by nature of learning English, you have to be open and accepting of things that are unfamiliar or uncomfortable with you. Exactly. This was an amazing talk. I hate to cut it off because I think we could chat all day about our experiences. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Do you have any last words or any advice for people if they want to bring these types of things into the classroom? Um, I guess only try to be bold. Uh, I know it's not easy sometimes to bring it, so try to be a bit bold because some people out there might profit a lot from what you you bring to class. So be bold enough to extrapolate what you have planned and uh, go to the others uh, 
go to the other person's reality as well. Extrapolate yours. I guess this is what I would try to to encourage people to do. That's an amazing message. Well, I want to thank you, Arthur, for spending time with me today. Thank you. All of you. Yeah. I hope all of you have enjoyed it. And uh, of course, I'll put Artur's uh, contact information in the show notes. So if you have questions or just want to get in touch with him because he's an amazing person, feel free. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Ready to join the conversation? Head on over to Instagram at Real Talk in ELT Podcast or on at English with Kelly and send me a message. That's it for me. Take care of yourself, your health, your vibe, and your tribe. Until next time.